just to quickly kind of go through, we're going to do some brief introductions, talk about the problem at hand and why everybody on the call today should be concerned about what it is that we're talking about. We're then going to spend 45 minutes um, with some real casual discussion. There are only a few slides in the presentation. This is really going to be more um, just of a discussion back and forth. Please feel free to put questions into the chat as we go. And at the end, we'll reserve for, uh, 15, roughly 15 minutes to cover some of those questions. Um, the first topic we're really going to talk about is, again, securing your supply chain and what are supply chain issues and how Systec um, is able to uh, correct some of these problems that we're seeing in the market. And then we're going to spend, um, you know, the hot topic item today, which is talking about age gating access. So just briefly, um, I'm not going to spend too much time myself. I'm owner and behavior, lead behavioral scientist for um, ARAC. Um, I bring seven years of experience in the nicotine tobacco industry, working at Altria um, and leading and managing perception and behavioral studies for them. Um, I am. Uh, being joined by first Dave DeGene, who is head of sales and business development for Systec. Um, he brings, I guess, 35 years of experience working um, with brand protection, supply chain, transparency, um, and brings a focus in regulatory compliance, specifically uh, a great deal of experience within the pharmaceutical industry. And also I have Eric Hawk, um, an anti-illicit trade expert. He is a former law enforcement, and, and thank you for that service. Um, he has spent about 25 years within this sector working in the UN uh, Security Investigation Service and then spent several years within the private sector in the um, tobacco industry. So I think it's going to be a lively discussion uh, today and turning first to, again, just again, why are we here? Hopefully all of us on here, we read the news um, daily about uh, counterfeit products. Um, we certainly know about a valley that happened. Um, and these are all major issues that every single person working in this industry should be concerned about. We should be concerned about it from a consumer protection standpoint, uh, which is a direct relationship to the public health, which is why we have some people here on the call today who are from a regulatory body, FDA and CTP, uh, because they are concerned about it. And then obviously we should be concerned about it as the tobacco industry because we need to protect our brands we need to protect our products and our consumers. So when we think about that, think about this, this, this question. What would happen if your companies, um, but roughly 25 to 35% of your current product sales were actually coming from counterfeit products? So again, not only should we first and foremost be concerned about what is the public health effect of that, these products not being real, not having gone through the appropriate manufacturing processes that industry manufacturers in place, um, that could be potentially harmful to our consumers. Again, referencing the Valley situation, which still today impacts our transitioning from adult smokers to a potentially less harmful product, such as an e-vapor or e-cigarette product. Consumers, I speak of them all the time, they, they don't wanna try those products because of the news from Valley. Little did they know that every single one of those instances comes, came from a counterfeit product. But also you all should be concerned, we all should be concerned from a business perspective and bottom line, because that 25 to 35% of sales is not coming to your business and organization when it's a counterfeit product. Um, so I'm gonna insert a quick poll here and I'm gonna launch it. So we have the answer at the end. I want you all to look at these two products, A and B. And I want you to answer the poll to indicate which of these is the counterfeit product. And I'll give you just a second to do that because we have a whole lot of things to cover. And you all may not be able to, to get the poll finished. So if I could be a lot of people responding now. There, there, it's amping up, good. And this is so interesting. I'll give you just another second. That's amazing. All right, I'm gonna stop the poll at literally 50-50. Um, so we'll get back to that in just a minute. So let's turn then um, to the meat of this discussion today. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing and it's really just gonna be again, a conversation between us. Um, so when we think about what happened back in 2019 with the Valley, 
Um, and I mentioned earlier, and I think Eric can confirm this, but all of the instances where people were having significant lung injuries, they were from counterfeit products. Um, why should we care about that now today? Um, why should manufacturers in the nicotine tobacco industry care about that? And I'll start with you, Dave. Um, well, I mean, obviously, illicit product is causing harm to consumers, and they're not aware, you know, if they're, if they're purchasing it from a legitimate site, um, or from a, le a legitimate retailer, and they're getting illicit product, and then they're being harmed by it, I mean, obviously, it still can taint the brand um, that they actually had purchased. And obviously, you know, I don't think anybody wants to, to hurt people you know, out in the in the market. So um, I, I just think we have to do something about making sure illicit product doesn't get into the legitimate supply chain um, to protect. And how, and how do you do that? Uh, that? So that's a that's a really broad that's a really broad topic. Um, you know, kind of goes into um, some of what I want to talk about today, which was really um, the pharmaceutical supply chain and how that is protected. I don't know if you want to go there now, but um, yeah, I mean, I mean, start, or I mean, like, yeah. yeah, the the other option. I mean, from an illicit product detection standpoint, Systec has a technology. We we call it e fingerprint. It basically allows us to take the existing barcode on a product, um, any UPC barcode, QR codes. Um, have a little example here of a QR code. Um, and it, we take a picture of it in manufacturing and that then can be used, um, basically authenticated with a simple mobile device, um, any Android, any iPhone, and you actually just scan it and it will tell you that that product is authentic or it's a suspect. Um, and generally then what we would hope is if, you know, and you can actually put in messaging um, on it, you know, provide some consumer engagement um, in regards to, you know, what they just scanned. If it's a suspect product, you can give them instructions on how to, um, you know, who and how to, to tell somebody that you've got a product that you think is suspect and go back to the manufacturer that you, that is being, you know, actually being copied or counterfeited. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of ways to, um, that this technology and it's being used, it's widely adopted in um, every hot market product. So during COVID, it was PPE devices um, N95 masks were protecting. Uh, we have protected vape products in the past, you know, ENDS products in, in the past and still do. We do um, COVID test kits because they were, again, real hot on the market. Um, and there were as many counterfeits out there as there were real ones, um, yeah. which is, you know, again, you know, from a public health standpoint, those are, you know, very risky things not to be working if, if they're counterfeit. Yeah. yeah. So I know in the past, long time ago, when cigarettes were, you know, the hot topic, and um, I, I know, Eric, I think you've retrieved, what is it, 5.6 billion cigarettes that were counterfeit over the lifespan of your career. So to your point, though, Dave, it is now transitioned within this industry to be e-vapor and e-cigarette products. And there's really what I have viewed as a very inconsistent approach to protecting the supply chain and protecting the products across the different organizations and companies, whether it's large tobacco, medium, small. Um, and so I think that's why we're seeing such rapid, again, referencing Eric, uh, $8 million worth of counterfeit vapes that you yourself have seized. If Valley is happening. Um, so Dave, can you walk me through um, what you believe and your technology has proven that what does it mean to protect your supply chain and to secure it? And what are the pillars or what are the processes to do that? Sure. Sure. So um, there are regulations in most of the major markets um, at some level for serialization tracking of prescription pharmaceutical products. Um, pharmaceutical, I think, is way out ahead of most supply chains in regards to securing them um, today. And, and for obvious reasons, you know, counterfeit medicines, you're either not going to get well or you're taking something that is not, you know, nobody counterfeits the medicine. They counterfeit the packaging and whatever's in that product is not a medicine. It's sugar pills, it's drywall and paint, 
you know, it's not what you think it is. <clears throat> so um, these regulations, they really span a whole, you know, each region or part of the world decides how they want to do it um, on their own. Um, there are standards um, that are, are primarily adopted by GS1 for the barcode type to use, and also um, what's called EPCIS, which is the communication between trading partners. So that's the predominant standards in this, but um, the, really the gold standard for traceability is the US market. Um, back in uh, November 27th of 2013, President Obama at the time signed into law what's referred to as um, DSCSA, um, and they gave base, basically get, they gave ten years to implement um, this supply chain traceability security platform, um, and we're in the final stages of it. So, 2023 in November 27th, it has to be fully enabled, and we've fa been phasing it in since 2018. Um, and it has basically a whole series of pillars and participants in the supply chain and how they protect those, the products. So it starts with the manufacturer where they have to serialize and aggregate in manufacturing. Um, and aggregation is the process of, you know, you put a serial number on a unit level carton, it gets put into a shipper case. We know which ones went into that shipper case. And then we put a serial number on the outside of the shipper case so that now, when we put the shippers on the pallets, you have one ID, you have a pallet ID, and it carries all those serial numbers with it. And they know the aggregation is, is what, which ones are in which case. And so that later in the supply chain, when those products continue to move through, they may not move through as full pallets. They will to the wholesaler, but the wholesaler will break it down and ship cases to some people. And in some cases, they'll go all the way down to the individual units and, and send them to the store. So, that's the serialization aggregation part. Second pillar is what that we call EPCIS messaging. So it's using the GS1 standards to message now as the product moves through the supply chain. So it's being shipped from a manufacturer to a wholesaler, all of that data associated with it of when, what lot it is, what serial numbers, all the aggregation information needs to be sent with that product. And if the wholesaler receives product that doesn't have the data, they cannot receive it. It stops. And so um, so it has to, so now what's ended up happening is the data becomes almost as important as the product. Now, uh, yep. can't say it's more important than the product because pharmaceuticals are life-saving drugs. So, you know, that's really important. But now with this Supply Chain Act, if it doesn't have the data, that wholesaler has no rights to move that product through the supply chain. So what do you, it, and it can't sit there because they don't have the capacity to have product that they can't move. So we'll actually go, have to go back to the manufacturer until they actually correct the data and send it through. So that's the second pillar. And then the third pillar is um, what I'll, I'll call credentialing is what it's referred to. It's making sure that trading partners are authorized. So a manufacturer will have X number of authorized wholesalers that they deal with and they have a relationship and, and basically there's a process to become an authorized, you have to go through a certification process, um, but then the ATP the credentialing service now allows us to electronically verify that the data that I'm sending in this EPCIS message is going to an authorized trading partner and they are the only ones receiving that. So we're, we're basically creating a credentialing service that allows trading partners to know that they're authorized to receive and, and distribute product. Um, the next is really what's called verification. At any time along the way, and certainly when products are returned back, the regulation requires that return products are, are verified. So, because that is a lot where illicit trade comes into when it's moving from a distribution partner back to a manufacturer or from a retail back to a wholesaler. Those, those situations is where illicit product gets into the supply chain. So now there, there's a requirement to verify anything that's being returned. Plus, if there's somebody believes it's a suspect product, they can request a verification. And it's just a serial number verification, but it goes all the way back to the manufacturer to say, yes, this is a legitimate product. Yeah. 
And then the last pillar of this, which is really not done, the fifth pillar is, is, is really what's called tracing. And it's not done because this is the standard the, that is, has yet, is still in um, working groups to, to be ratified. Um, so all the vendors like ourselves are waiting and work well working as part of these team these teams and these these working groups um, to identify how to do this. This is one of the things that the FDA did re very well was they partnered with industry and there are there are industry groups that are you know made up of you know um, pharmacies, wholesalers, manufacturers, regulatory agencies, technology providers, you know, we're all participating in developing the standard. So it's an industry driven standard that's complying to the law and the regulation that the FDA is enforcing. Um, so the last piece is tracing and it's basically creating a history of that product on demand. If the FDA want, says, I wanna see everywhere where this product went in its life, it will have basically the transaction history um, in, at each point. Um, and it's really, really surprising um, there's a there's a book out there that anybody's interested in reading. It's a um, it reads like a novel, but it's basically an investigator reporter that um, talked about the problems with the U the U.S. supply chain. Um, there's a product. Um, it was a manufacturer's product for on oncology. It moved to close to 60 different locations before it ended up in a strip club in Florida, where it was water bathed. Label was changed. It then went to the, got back into the supply chain, got to a patient, a 15 year old, and it didn't work because they had water bath and changed the dosage on it to be 10 times higher than what was in that syringe. And the patient wasn't getting better. And the doctor knew, thought and knew that this drug would actually help him and basically went back to the manufacturer and said, I think there's something wrong with your product. And they found out that it was one tenth the dosage of what the patient was supposed to be getting. So even in that case, it's not, you know, the differential was the price point between, you know, the one yeah. versus the other and the wholesaler was getting that difference in price. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that kind so, of start, those, those incidents have started this. Yeah. Um, so if I can jump in. So, um, yeah. I think you do a great job of, of working through those five pillars, um, specific, obviously, to the pharmaceutical industry from Obama's um, enactment into law. Um, I think all of us here on the call can probably agree with the statement that we have seen very much a parallel from the pharmaceutical industry to the nicotine and tobacco industry. Um, and again, on, on this you know, webinar, we have our regulators. You know, I think we have some people from FDA and CGP, and we have large manufacturers, we have small manufacturers, we have scientists, all sorts of people in the webinar today. And we have seen this progression of, you know, the PMTA guidance, for example, some studies I know in my realm, such as human factor studies and being able to do these behavioral based studies and randomized designs, that really is drawing a parallel from what they, the guidance is that the FDA and CTP or FDA has put out from the pharma industry. So I think Dave, what you're trying to do is paralleling again, the supply chain processes and securing that. Um, and I think what we found is that, you know, we're probably, I don't know, five, eight, 10 years behind the pharma um, uh, industry. And I think a, an important part to point in this is we have an opportunity here to work together to design and to implement, design and implement um, this type of process with the FDA, so with our regulator and with industry and with the working groups, should an enactment come down that you know is then going to be enforced. So I want to then turn this, Eric, to, to these five different pillars that, that Dave's talking about. You also have extensive tobacco and industry experience. What are some implications based on what you've seen in real life and you know seizing the counterfeit products and, and all this this kind of um, real world experience? What's the applicability there? This is, Dave mentioned some really exciting things that can be done nowadays with this technology. And going back a little bit to the Ivali that you mentioned, this was something that, that if would have existed then, and if manufacturers would have been using this system, a lot of this would have been uh, not happening, first of all, because you had counterfeit, it was counterfeit devices, counterfeit refills, and you had people refilling their own devices with counterfeit liquids 
that they thought were something else. So th these were the issues. Um, so if we would work together, I think as an industry with the FDA, with, the, with our government partners, we can stop this counterfeit coming into our, our industry. And this is what's killing us. You know, as you mentioned, uh, 25 to 35, in some cases, even 50% of products out there are counterfeit in some locations. And this is incredible. You know, if you could have a, a way to authenticate products, even at the customer level, uh, you know, customer, customs, FDA investigators, you know, if they had something they could have on their phone uh, to let them know something was authentic or counterfeit, this would be amazing. This would be a breakthrough with our industry. And it would really show that we are policing ourselves. We are protecting our own brands and we are working with the government to, to enact some kind of policies that could help us. Yes, yeah, so Eric, where would you say the illicit products originate, come into the US and how, and how again to, can this I think one time we were talking like, hey, if I can take my phone as a law enforcement or something, you know, scan it, that would be amazing. So tell me a little bit about that. Right, exactly. Well, the products aren't manufactured here. So they're all coming in from somewhere, even the legitimate products, they're all, they're all coming in from overseas. And uh, they're either coming in by port, of course, or they're coming in a lot of times on flights that even though it's uh, against the law for, for people to do that, they're shipping a lot of these products as freight on airlines. So we have a lot of cases I've seen where Customs Border Protection contact me and say, hey, you know, from JFK or something and say, we got a flight and we have these pallets coming off. Can you tell me, are these legitimate products? And they kind of get on a video call with me and we're going through products. So if they had something that could tell them immediately that this is counterfeit or non-legitimate, they would be able to act. Um, and if manufacturers would work with the, with the FDA and with Customs and Border Protection, just to let them know, for example, here's the contact details of who to call when you have a question. And these are where we ship our products in from. You know, these, a lot of manufacturers only use one port in the U.S. They'll bring their products into one location only and then distribute from there. So it's really easy to tell Customs and Border Protection, listen, if you have products coming in anywhere else in the country, that's not us. You know, seize it immediately yeah. because that's not us. So that that would really help. Yeah. And so um, before we get into, I know the hot topic that I think I'm, I'm feel like we're getting there. Um, but when we talk about a secure supply chain and the processes that are involved in that, Again, as I mentioned, there are big players, you know, that that are on this webinar and, and might be seeing it later, and also the smaller players. And they want to be legitimate. They want to do what's right. You know, they don't get money if the products that consumers are, are using aren't really theirs. Right. So, Dave, what you just talked about seems really complex and seems like there's a lot to it. Um, is there a role for the larger folks and the smaller folks? Yes. Um, and, and again, using pharma as a, as a parallel here, there are very, very big multinational pharmaceutical manufacturers that have to implement serialization aggregation across you know, multiple sites and many lines. We've got customers that have 300 packaging lines that actually produce products and have to have this, these systems doing the serialization aggregation. But we also have you know, biotech firms that have one product that they've just launched and they only launched it in one market, most likely because most biotechs are actually launched in the US because um, this is the most expensive market, if you will. There's people that will pay for it. Um, but they may only have, you know, they, they've they got a contract manufacturer. They have, you know, uh, a virtual 3PL moving their product. So they have no physical presence and they can comply to the regulation just as easy as a, pharma, a large pharmaceutical. The difference between those is obviously, you know, the, the big multinationals are gonna spend a lot more money because they have to do it for so many more products than, than some of the small guys. And I think that that parallels very, very well into this, this market as well. There's gonna be big players and then there's gonna be you know, small players and, and what the investment is, is going to be, you know, vary based upon 
um, based upon those sizes, but anybody can actually do it. Um, and, and because this is such a big market, you know, I would love to say we're the only vendor out there, but we're not. There are a lot of people that do this. We happen to be one of the largest um, and, you know, we support most of the major pharmaceutical manufacturers, but we're also doing this in other markets that don't have regulatory. We're doing it for baby formula across um, multi regions because it, you know, it's been hit with a lot of counterfeit products. It's been hit with a lot of issues where they need to be able to recall it and return it. So they have business reasons why they need to do this level of traceability. And we've done it with, with vape and we've done it with, um, uh, crop sciences products where, you know, there was counterfeit, counterfeit, um, crop, you know, it, the fertilizer was, was basically counterfeit and it would kill, wipe out entire fields. Um, wow. because it, it they're, they're, the seeds are basically genetically created for the fertilizer. So it's all science. And if you get a counterfeit, it'll wipe out a whole, a, a whole state of stuff. So it's, there are people that are doing this outside of, you know, med medical devices, consumer electronics, outside of regulatory driven requirements. The pharmaceutical industry just happens to be the one that's probably leading when it comes to regulatory driven implementation. Right. right. So to that end, kind of moving into the um, next main topic, although we'll still, I think, leverage some of the supply chain focus, but um, so I was recently at um, Fidley Conference and um, Brian King was there um, and presented to us. And I'm just going to read um, a little bit about what he responded to some of our questions. So we're focused on uh, youth use um, and, you know, regardless of the percentage of youth that are using nicotine tobacco products, obviously we don't want any to, um, but what can we do to, to prevent it? What can we do? Um, what can the industry do so that we can get products on the market and authorized through the pathways and, and get flavors back on the market? So Brian King stated that um, he acknowledged there is a problem with illegal sales. Um, and then he noted, you know, again, the statistics on the youth use of eBay for products. Um, the question to him was, well, is there anything that, cu that currently CTP has in their enforcement toolbox that can be used to, to be in leverage to reduce youth use. It was interesting because his response was regarding youth use that there is no single policy that's going to eliminate it, which I happen to absolutely agree with him. Um, and that innovation um, is one way. So innovation is key with the, were his, his exact words, um, but also urged industry to come up with ways to mitigate the risk, risk of youth use. So, before we go into much the technology of what SysTech has that can uh, potentially prevent youth use, going to the supply chain, what percentage of illegal um, you know, use, whether that's through youth um, or just illegal counterfeit products, do you think could be reduced or mitigated through a secure supply chain process like those five pillars that you just talked about? And um, Eric, I'll turn to you just because you're, you've got the tobacco and nicotine um, uh, experience. Sure. The, you know, we could, I'm, I'm positive that we could eliminate 80 to 90 percent of the illicit trade, especially in youth use of products, if we use the technology that's available with Syntex. You know, it, it's amazing. The technology is amazing and Dave can speak on it, but I can tell you that the, the dangers of not taking action are that if your brand is, is targeted or liked by the youth and you sell a lot and youth end up using your brand, you know, they will destroy your brand because once the authorities see that the youth are using this brand and getting their hands on it, whether or not it's counterfeit, you know, because no one, no one uh, mentions that in the news stories, you know, and the government doesn't see that as a, as an excuse, let's say for your company, if it's counterfeit. So it's just your brand, everyone knows, and they can destroy the good name that you've you spent years, you know, trying to build um, by liking your product. So I, I think we can eliminate that using these these uh, technologies that Syntech has to offer for sure. Yeah. So it's an indirect way, I would say, of reducing youth use through the supply uh, through the supply 
I'm sorry, secure supply chain using these technologies. Yes, for sure. And if we work together, you know, that's the key, working together with the authorities, with the FDA investigators, because they want to do well, they want to do their job, and they need help. So just like any other government agency, they need some help from the citizens and from, from corporate world. So yeah. if we can secure the supply chain, prevent youth use using the technology that Dave can, can discuss here, you know, this would go a long way and would make the job so much easier for investigators and for law enforcement because they could use their phone and they know immediately, hey, this is counterfeit. We're seizing all of this. You know, it, it would be incredible. Yeah. And so before I turn to Dave, I think it's a good point you just mentioned that because um, I, along with many others in the industry, say frequently, well, the FDA just needs to enforce it, right? Or, or the enforcement parties just need to enforce it. Um, and But I think, how? How are they going to enforce it when they don't have these processes established? Um, but what I think, again, I'll turn you, Dave, is that what you're saying is that they could literally use their cell phone to come into um, a mom and pop shop, the whatever store, um, and could scan it, and it would pop up whether it's an, a legitimate product or not. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So amazing. amazing. I've been just to to mention. I've had instances where FDA investigators contacted me, and I went to a location that they had raided to several locations. And we would have to walk through almost every product. And they would oh say, well, what do you think? Is this counterfeit or not? So I'm happy to do it, you know, because that's all, all our product at the time. But the FDA needs help. And there were several times when I couldn't tell if our own product was counterfeit or not. And I had to call someone else and get them on a video call and say, tell me how to break this apart. Because I'm here in the shop. We have a pallet you know, or several pallets of this, and how can we tell if this is counterfeit? So so this is something that's really needed within the industry. Yeah. So let's turn now to, um, uh, so a recent study came out, federally funded study, February of this year, 45% um, of um, vapors who, let's just say, there's a large percentage of those that were uh, former smokers, who said if there's a federal ban on flavors that they're just going to um, seek flavors illegally. Um, so what we're seeing in the industry, um, and, and I have personally seen it in, in speaking with thousands and thousands of smokers, which is uh, they do assist in their transition from combustible cigarettes. So we also are not seeing any of industry's e-vapor ends products being authorized by the agency. Um, I do think there are studies that still need to be done that, that will give hopefully the FDA support to authorize that, that might not have been done yet. Um, but if we think about where we're, it looks like we're going, which is non-authorization of flavored products and roughly 50% of vapor is going to seek illegal alternatives to flavors. Um, what are the implications for that? Um, you know, when, we, when it comes to the, whatever product they're going to put in their, you know, ingest in their system, if there's no secure supply chain. Um, and then also thinking about the age gating and how we do know that youth also enjoys flavors. So now we have a problem where the youth, some of them enjoy flavors um, and products and are using them. They shouldn't be. Now we have a scenario where Flavors are banned, are supposed to be, but they're going to be illegal on the market somehow. So how on earth can we combine a supply chain process that you've talked about, Dave, with a potential solution to prevent youth use from actually using a product? Dave? Yep. Like so, yeah, I, I can cover that. Um, if, uh, if you think about a, a safe supply chain you know, we, and the five pillars that we talked about, the only piece that we're actually missing there is kind of the age gating process. Um, and we can add basically a sixth pillar, which is just that an age ver a POS age verification. Um, and then literally um, authorizing, potentially authorizing the use of the product by registering it with you know, the user with the phone. Um, so you're scanning, you know, they're scanning the serial number that's on the package. 
It's saying, uh, you know, I'm buying this package. I've proved to the to the retailer that I'm um, legally of age. Um, so now it's a safe product. It's come through the supply chain in a safe way. You've actually scanned it. Um, they have now basically at least a way that they've registered that they purchased that particular product. Um, and they would go through that every time they purchased a product. Um, now, yeah. now that will never prevent, unfortunately, that will never prevent the illicit product. So, so a safe supply chain does not stop counterfeit. There's, it's two separate things, but it changes where you can buy those counterfeits. A legitimate retailer is not going to, because they have, they're an authorized trading partner, they're not going to have a listed product in their hands because they purchased it through the legitimate supply chain. It's now the illicit product is coming through an, a, a legal supply chain. And probably, I think I heard you say one time, Eric, I mean, there's, there's, vans that look like shops that pull into parking lot and you can buy, you know, vape products, you can buy all the, all the flavors you want. You know, that obviously is not a legitimate, he's not, a, not an authorized trading partner and he's not selling and not doing age verification. And there's really no way to stop that unless you have a supply chain that really clamps down and stops those things from happening. That that van could never be an authorized trading partner, so they could never be selling value, you know, real product. Right. And, you know, talk, so talk to me a little because I know, I know that um, again at Fidley there was another company presenting on some of this technology um, with an ENDS product, mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's you know phone app where you um, you know you, you sign on and it's connected to a specific product. So they were presenting on that at Fidley. And I think you were referencing some of that, but what you were saying, which is which is different, which is I go to the store and at point of sale, they scan, you know, whatever the barcode, the QR code, whatever kind of technologies that you all do or provide yeah. on the, the package or on the product. And it's then attached to your cell phone. And that product can only be used if that cell phone is near the device. So we know we because we know the youth, they're not going to wah wah and buying it. They're getting it from their parents, but or their family or friends or whatever. But what you're saying is that you have a technology that would prevent them from using it if the person that was age verified is not there present. So two steps there. So the first right. step, the first step is basically enabling age verification and associating it to a legitimate product. So that's that's kind of that sixth or the sixth pillar of a safe supply chain. The holy grail of age gating is to be able to get to a point where a device can't be activated unless that association that you've done in the store that I bought this legitimate product, I've authenticated it with my phone. Now I've actually enabled that device. And this is where we would have to work with the manufacturers of the device where it can be disabled by the use of a phone a phone app um, where now we've done that whole safe supply chain. We know the products that are in the legitimate supply chain are safe, but now we're actually able to link a phone using Bluetooth enabled. It's like your, your speakers, your yeah. mouses, whatever, you're basically connecting to them. But yeah. here it would be a, it would be a one-time connect and, and that connection can only be used if this phone is near that device. Um, and those technologies are available. It's not, it, it, but it does require a collaboration with the manufacturer to because they'll have to build the technology, you know, into their roadmap of how when they can have a a smart device, if you will, that can link to a phone that can be disabled if it's not an authorized person that's using that phone. Right. And I just want to point out, because I know there's I think, a few questions in the chat, and I know this has been a hot topic, um, and I've actually done much research on it, which is, um, you know, it's kind of 50-50, probably less even 50% of consumers, they don't really want to go on their phone app every time they use the product. These, if we can think in mind, I'm an adult smoker, I just want to smoke my cigarette, why do I have to go through these steps? And so we have seen a you know, a bit of pushback on some of the technology that from a consumer's perspective, mm -hmm. but I think the regulator is enjoying it. But what you're saying, Dave, is that they don't have to do that every time they go to use the no. product. One it time. just needs to be there. 
Right. It, it, it's a one-time connection. It's like, uh, I'll use the analogy of like when you connect your mobile phone to your car, you have to, you have to do that process one time. Right. Every time after that, when you walk in, you see, it sees your phone, the car is going to connect to it and you're going to play your radio. You're going to go to yeah. car play. Yeah. All those yeah. apps are available to you. So the technology is there to do it just one time. One but that time. one time is very important because you yeah. want that one time to be age verification driven. So right. they've proven that they're, you know, over yeah. 21 or whatever age they have to be to use the device. And, and it's their phone and that, you know, now it's connected to that device. Right, right. So and you would have to do it every time they got a new device, but it's not every time they're using it. It, it just has right. to, be, it has to be with them to use it. Right, and it's very much so, um, what I understand is just like a, an adult goes and purchases the product and they scan their ID, they're literally doing that at the same time. My phone, boom, it's done. It's and done. now that's preventing the child from coming and sneaking it, you know, um, and, and, you know, unless they take their parents' phone, which again, parents would definitely recognize when their phone's gone. Um, <laughs> All you know, the parents I know would never let go of their phone. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have just a few more minutes before Q&A. I know we have a bunch in the chat, but I do want to bring up one other thing that I think is really important. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, di um, different major differences in the cost of products within the ends category. You know, you could get a disposable for four bucks or you can go and get a very high tech device for $40. Um, it's very important from a public health perspective that we're not leaving out certain groups of, of um, people. And we know that adult smokers are typically lower SES, less, less education, living in areas that might not have um, the ability to get to the other stores that we do. And it's important that we don't make that gap bigger um, and we're considering health disparities through our technological advances. And so, um, but I, you know, I also know that recent federal study came out, I think 94% of the lowest income individuals in the United States own um, a smartphone. So that has become, that standard has increased, you know, whereas maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, that would not have been existence, right? Um, so that, that's one good thing, but tell me a little bit how, um, this can be incorporated into the different types of ENDS products, whether being disposable or open system or pod based, and how we can make sure that we're bridging the gap between the different um, demographics in our country. Is that a question for me or for Eric? Either of you. Eric, <laughs> would you like to start? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll mention something. To, first of all, I'm a, I'm a bit familiar with Syntex, and, and I know that their products can be implemented across the entire chain of what you're speaking about from $4 to, to the most expensive devices out there. But, uh, and, and just to comment about that as well, um, as you mentioned earlier, that people in, in the business and in manufacturing and with companies go to the authorities and we, we want them to take action. You know, we're saying don't, don't implement new laws, enforce the laws that you have already on the books and, uh, and we want them to do something to protect our brands and to protect the, the consumer. But the FDA is saying, listen, um, I need help. Yeah. You know, there are a few of us, the, the regulations are a little bit confusing even for them. So we need, they need some help. And this is the kind of thing that can help. And when they go into an area, when they conduct raids or when they see people in a, in a van or in a car with the, with the uh, trunk open and they're selling vapes out of the trunk, um, right now, they can't really take action right. because they don't. There's no way for them to know is this counterfeit or not. You know, they they pull out products. What do you expect them to do? You know, so if they had, if the manufacturers had a system in place such as Syntex, where they could scan the the items, then they could easily take action. And they scan a couple items. Okay, these are all counterfeit. You're under arrest. All this is seized. You know, this is an easy case for them. So this is how we can help and we can get things done. And Dave, you can you can speak about what you have to offer as well for the, the low priced items as well as the high. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's two parts to the question because I think if we talk about it from an age gating standpoint, that, that does require the manufacturer to put something in the device so that it can be paired with the phone 
and also disabled, regardless of whether it's disposable or a high-end device. Um, but at, at a minimum, if it is purely used for age gating and there's not other features, I can't imagine that's a high cost change from you know, a long-term roadmap of the product. Um, but you know, I guess there has to be work done on that. In regards to purely preventing counterfeit, you know, a safe supply chain is, is a great way to, to limit the amount of illicit product that's moving through a legitimate supply chain. So what we talked about with pharma regulations, it's a great thing to, to do, but you need participation from all of the supply chain partners. So there has to, to me, it has to be some probably regulatory driven thing to get those, all those participants to, you know, to pony up for it. Yeah. But from a listed product standpoint, it, we're talking in, in the volumes that you're talking in vape, you're talking sub sense for to use the technology that we have developed. It's very inexpensive in high volumes. We have certain companies that you know produce very high value pharmaceutical products that you know cost thousands of dollars for prescriptions. And for them, it's not subsets because it's an extremely expensive product. Yeah. But certainly as it scales and the volumes go up and you know, like with disposables, I'm sure they're in really high demand. They turn very fast. Obviously the amount of volumes in those, you know, they're gonna be, you know, subsent type um, costs associated with it. So it's not, it's not a major impact to the manufacturer from my, my perspective. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be respectful of the time for Q&A. Um, so before I um, kind of wrap this up from our end, um, just want to throw it out there. Um, Dave, if you can put in the chat uh, your email address, Eric, yours as well, just in case anybody has follow-up questions specific to your roles as an anti-licit expert in the field versus Dave and the technologies um, available through Systech, that'd be great. Um, also, just want to throw out there that um, Keller and Heckman's um, nicotine conference, February 15th and 16th, we will be um, there showtime um, at one of their webinars. So, you know, hopefully you guys are signed up to attend that. What would be really great for that is if we can receive feedback from this webinar session and um, expand upon part of the talking points so that we're providing uh, new information in February and um, you know we can have some work to do between now and then to provide you with additional information it would be great. So let's turn to our audience, um, some Q&A here. Um, Eric, where did you just do that? Because to me, it looks like I um, can only select you or... Oh, really? So yeah. I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it, Dave. Thank you, because it's yeah. only it's only showing you three. Oh, yeah, it's actually so, yeah. Yeah. All right, so here's our first question from uh, Francesco. Hello, hello. Um, hi, all. This is great. Thanks for putting this webinar together. It was great to meeting. It was great meeting you at the Next Gen Nicotine Delivery event in Miami. Oh. I have one question: How much does the supply chain of harm reduction products impact public safety? I can start if. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't say I, I don't have a direct answer for, for how much. Um, so I think what he's trying to say is these are harm reduction products, right? Potentially harm reduction. These are not combustible cigarettes. Um, so by implementing all of these steps, how much are we really impacting the public safety? But I would say it's just as important um, as combustible cigarettes and, and making sure that we're protecting the supply chain in any type of nicotine and tobacco product, whether it's be, it's gonna be pouch products down the road. Um, anything that you're ingesting or inhaling, um, and Dave can speak to the pharmaceutical industry and why that was so critical to get this on lockdown, which is these are going in people's bodies. And so anytime you have any kind of a substance that could potentially not be the substance you think it is, um, it is going to have an impact on public safety um, and public health. And Dave, you wanna to speak to how you got here with the pharmaceutical industry? little bit how we got to the point of this drug security act or yeah because it yeah. impacts public safety because it impacts right. public safety right. yeah but it's it, it really was you know the fda has, has enacted um different regulations over 
you know, certainly my history, um, 35 years of experience um, with the, the, the most critical issues that are impacting that industry. So for um, back years ago, it was cut labels where um, labeling mix-ups were the number one cause of accidental deaths in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so they were, you know, putting the wrong medicine in the wrong bottles and it was going out and it wasn't what it was expected to be. So they put regulations in place that said you have to electronically verify every label so you know you're producing the right product and putting it in the right packaging. That's, that's really how this traceability thing got started was actually California had a regulation that was in 2005 that really started it that said that all products coming to to um, California had to have RFID and serialization in that RFID devices or products, which would have been a an crazy, incredibly costly venture uh, because the wholesalers don't know what products are gonna go to California until they're in their wholesale. That means, so that means the manufacturers would have to put RFID into every single device, every single product that they had. So, it naturally, there was so much pushback from the industry saying that we can't afford to do this for one state that it began to start looking at is it okay, this isn't a pharmacy board state level decision to make. This needs to be the FDA coming in or the government coming in and saying, okay, that we have to have a federal standard for this. Um, and that's how it developed over a long time, starting back in 2005 until it actually was enacted. The law was enacted in 2013, and now the implementation is taking, you know, it has taken 10 years. And and to be honest with you, the fact that it's now all these standards have been developed and the technology is available, it doesn't take 10 years now for another industry to adopt it because the technology and the vendors and the processes and the standards group, it's already there. So it's already been built out. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I think the, the next market that uses these types of technologies, and we do it for non-regulatory, again, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a regulatory dri driven thing. Um, you know, we're, we're doing traceability in the vape industry, you know, for, for a client and it, and it, you know, it is helping them, um, but it's, you know, if you can get it to, it's everybody doing it, all using the same standard, all using the same, you know, interoperable technology, you're going to stop a lot of the illicit trade coming into the legitimate supply chain. And then you just have to protect the products that are in markets that are not, that don't have these types of regulations, or you have to protect the products, you know, that might be coming through an illegal channel. Right with the other types of technology that we talk about with the fingerprint technology um, and the mobile authentication. That's just, you know, that, those are kind of bookend. You do it in manufacturing, you authenticate it anywhere in the supply chain and we'll tell you where it was authenticated. So. so I think this kind of, it's a great question here and I think it's where you're going. Um, how do you reduce, prevent counterfeit products being procured on e-platforms or fake websites, which have now, per, 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 I can never say, proliferated. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think we talk, oh, sorry, we've talked about this before because yeah. we do have heavy e-commerce, online channels to uh, purchase nicotine, um, to, you know, tobacco products. So how does what you just said, Dave, which is this really tracking and tracing, how can that be um, implemented and applied for when you purchase the product online? So if it's a if it's a legitimate online purchase, which means you're buying it, you know, from and, and I'll I'll use the end end product market here as as an example. If you're going onto a manufacturer's website and you're purchasing product, and it's coming through that legitimate a legitimate authorized trader directly to you, this we cover these regulations cover that because the you know the direct to patient is one of the things that this has to have it we don't not all products are going to go to a dispensing location they're going to go directly to a patient so you have to be able to handle that it's when somebody reaches out to you know and i, I don't want to point to canada but there's online pharmacies everywhere and i can tell you um confidently that as soon as you go to an online pharmacy that you're not, you know, it's not a, a legitimate uh, trading partner, you're likely not getting the drug that you're asking for. 
and and, and there's really no way to there's no way to prevent that um, it, unless you you can protect your brand because you can make sure you can use these technologies to make sure that somebody can authenticate that product however it got to them but if you're going out and it's you know non-protected products and you're just finding an online retailer and you're buying anything that they have and those products don't have any protection on them then they're likely counterfeited products now eric i'm going to turn you in just a second but if i can just say real quick there is not a situation today which surprises me and i think could this be implemented should this be implemented any consumer could get their product whether they're online getting it from from the store they could get it do the scan and it can pop up and say warning whatever morning counterfeit or legal product or whatever because and eric i'll turn to you because you've said this before consumers don't want to consume illegal counterfeit product that could potentially harm them right. they're assuming that when i go and purchase the product online or in store that it's real and so with this this could be known for all consumers all you got to do is go beep and, and you'll make sure and it's verified that it's a legitimate product. So Eric, did you want to expand upon that? I know you're passionate about that. It, it, it yeah, just, right. I'll layer on it after you for a second. Go ahead. Well, yeah, to, exactly right. And, and as Dave spoke, just to use uh, medicine as an example, you go to the Canadian websites or something like that and, and the consumer assumes this is a Canadian website because it says Canada, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, <laughs> the item can be coming from anywhere in the world. But uh, but if you, the, the consumers go to these websites because they assume they're getting the real drugs from Canada, just cheaper than in the US. But if they knew that what they were buying was counterfeit, no one would buy this. Right. No one wants counterfeit medicines and no one wants counterfeit vapes because they're ingesting these items. Yeah. And and when you talk about, you know, the question about reducing counterfeit product being preferred to e-platforms, I have a lot of experience in this. And I'll tell you, there are many companies out there who will search e-platforms for your brand to protect your brand. And, and I can say that these technologies are not going to prevent bad actors from, from doing criminal activity. Definitely not. But you're going to protect your brand and you're going to protect your consumers and if you work together with the government and you have a good relationship with the authorities, with the FDA, with customs and with law enforcement, you can pretty much put a stop to the e-platform stuff with your brand if you take action. Yeah, and the only, the only thing that I wanted to try to layer in on that is, um, is that there's a perception in different markets about counterfeit products. And I, and I know this from, you know, working with many, many brands across many different, you know, different markets. Um, most people don't want consumers to know, most brands don't want to know, consumers to know that there is a potential risk of counterfeit products in the market. Right. They're afraid that that will drive them. So if, so if you're the first mover that comes in and says, I'm gonna do put anti-counterfeiting technology on my products and tell consumers to authenticate them, they're likely to move to another product than authenticate your product because you've basically told them. Now that's not true in markets that counterfeit is so prevalent that the consumers are now demanding that you have authentication technologies on the products, like in China, where 40, 30 to 40% of the products are illicit products, generally in the market. So the consumers there are absolutely mandating you have to give us ways to, to authenticate product. But here in the US and in Europe, there's still that, you know, that feeling like if we make this step to tell people that, you know, hey, authenticate our products, they're actually are afraid that they're going to lose some brand reputation yeah. for it. Um, right. so that's the only risk in it. Um, and just from my experience, but yeah, it's a valid what? point. I think that's why it's important that the regulators on this webinar um, get involved as well. Um, yeah. But you're exactly right. I would also say, you know, our market's a tad bit different. I feel like because um, we do know that nicotine, you know, is an addictive chemical. And so we yeah. know that and once people do find a brand or a type you know, a product that they like, there is um, maybe brand not so much in the end category, but there is that brand um, loyalty aspect. Right. Um, 
but I think that's a valid point. But at the end of the day, think how amazing it would be to be the companies who are stepping up um, to protect the consumers here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to note that we are at time and I want to be respectful of that. Um, so I do have several other questions in the chat. And if everybody would be willing, you know, I could um, get these tallied up and send them out then via we'll email um, afterwards and get the contact information for the specific individuals and certainly um, engage in that conversation. It would also just urge folks to attend in February um, where we can continue the discussion. Any last last thoughts or comments, Eric or Dave? No, thank you. Go all ahead, right, thank you all so much. Hope yeah, you have a happy Thank you very time. much. Thank you, everyone, for thank joining. And great moderating, Jessica. Oh, thank you. Great, great panelists. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.